Good morning. Um, as one of my panelists have already astutely pointed out, my name is not Sarah Ladislaw, um, who unfortunately has been detained uh, for um, uh, family responsibilities related to the weather. Um, so I've been called um, to uh, come to bat at the last minute. I don't know whether this is an annual event or not, but, but if it is, I would do have a suggestion that if you're gonna do it in January, this time of the year, maybe we should do it in Melbourne, uh, and we can catch the night session at the Australian Open at, after the conference. Uh, but we, we, I, I caught a bit of the last panel, so as I understand it, the format is for the moderator to speak as little as necessary. And, and then to give our um, uh, panelists uh, a few minutes uh, to uh, tee up uh, their thoughts and um, as, uh, to help us with what was definitely a very robust discussion in the previous panel. Uh, we're gonna uh, be addressing resources and sustainability, and, and I should point out uh, that uh, our two countries have certain similarities in terms of resource and endowment, um, uh, it, uh, uh, generally speaking, but also, and perhaps particularly in the energy sector, which is one of the uh, areas that we will be addressing. My name is Edward Chow. I'm from the uh, Energy and National Security Program uh, at CSIS here. Uh, we have a distinguished panel who uh, will be talking uh, about the, the issues that our two countries have in common, as well as areas of cooperation uh, between our two countries, uh, as well as uh, uh, throughout uh, the region, uh, particularly in Asia, which is uh, the theme of this conference. So with that, you, you have the bios of our speakers, so I won't uh, re uh, take the time uh, to, to introduce them properly. Uh, but uh, I, I would ask uh, um, Mr. Hill to get us started. Thank you, Thank you for uh, moderating our panel at such short notice. Um, I, uh, I wear many hats. Uh, uh, as a former Australian Defence Minister, I would have liked to contribute to the last panel as a former Australian Environment Minister for six years, I'm happy to contribute to this one. Um, the next 30 years, pressure on the world's natural resource base is growing, going to grow enormously. As population rises, the global population rises to over 9 billion people. And with rising standards of living, which will mean greater per capita consumption, Demand for food, water, and energy will be great. Already we have a picture of degraded soils, significantly depleted freshwater reserves, both surface and groundwater, and over-exploited ocean resources. And this is likely to be exacerbated by climate change, with increasing temperatures, more extreme weather events more often, and rising seawater levels. Now, I'm not seeking to paint a picture of doom and gloom. Uh, in fact, it can be argued that this is a success story. Less major wars, better education and health care, and the technical ability to exploit natural resources at scale have led to this dramatic change. But it will require a much greater effort to utilise the planet's natural resource endowment sustainably. We've developed an enormous capacity to exploit these natural resources. We need to put the same effort into learning how to produce more from less, how to take a greater return from our natural capital with reduced depletion of that capital base and the production of less waste. And that's our global challenge. And nowhere is this challenge going to be greater than in Asia. Air quality issues in China are one obvious example. Pressure on water resources in India is another. 
Yet nowhere in the world is the capacity to address these great issues more than in Australia and the United States. We just need to look at the ingenuity of Australia's dryland farmers and the technological brilliance of the US in the extraction of unconventional natural gas. What we've found, however, is that as developed economies with major natural resource industries and a strong education base, we can collaborate and achieve more in the sustainability challenge than working alone. This is not only at the technological level, but also in the development of a new generation of public policy that will better encourage the development of natural resources sustainably. As we know, this conference, Australia and the US, is Australia and the US in an emerging Asia. And as we just said, we're both major suppliers of natural resources to Asia. These resources are contributing to achieve the Asian miracle, contributing in turn, in, in, then in order to both economic and political stability in the region. We both believe in the importance of open markets in natural resources. We've seen in the past the dangers of resource scarcity. So we compete as suppliers, but we also collaborate in the objective of avoiding scarcity. What we now need to do is to collaborate in, sh in uh, sharing our expertise in sustainable development to an emerging Asia, both in the technologies and in the public policy. Uh, and I'll give you um, I've got two minutes, just a couple of examples in which we could do this, lessons that I've learned. My first is, is, is Northern California in the central food basin, where I've seen the extraordinary uh, ability of, of the land managers to extract groundwater to, to fuel that great agricultural asset, whilst at the same time recognising that that groundwater uh, is a barrier against inflows from the seawater through the San Francisco base and therefore being able to extract just the right amount of water to maximise the agricultural re return, whilst at the same time taking full benefit from the ecological services that nature has provided. The alternative would be massive engineering works to stop the inflow and obviously a less sustainable outcome. When you look at the, the challenges of groundwater and surface water management in both China and India, for example, taking those experiences, that sort of expertise to the region would be extraordinarily valuable. And from an Australian perspective, I give you the example of soil security. Up to 75% of the globe's soils, and particularly in Asia, are now significantly degraded. And a lot of it has been the consequence of loss of carbon from within the soil, which has led to a breakdown of structure and a loss of the biological processes of the soil through unsustainable farming practices over a long period of time. Both Australian farmers, uh, in collaboration with Australian science and also in the United States, have learned there are better ways to farm that can actually restore the carbon to soil repair the damage that was done and allow for the production of the sort of food demands that we have in the past. And from a public policy, and obviously from a, uh, a science policy, the development of, <coughs> of modern herbicides that have avoided the tilling of the land has been a big part of that. But then at the public policy level, the development of public policies that is going to enable to encourage and support the adoption of those techniques by farmers that will reintroduce carbon to the soil. So again, potentially together, we can work in the region and take these experiences to Asia in a way that's going to help them to be much more sustainable in the future. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Mr. Wood. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I uh, had the opportunity to uh, 
Sorry. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. I was here at the uh, Alliance 21 meeting last year where we had a full day specifically talking about energy and resources, and it's interesting that some of the themes we discussed then are reoccurring uh, today. I wanted to touch upon maybe three or four things and, and link them together that seem to me to be framing a lot of the things that will play out uh, on energy particularly and, and energy and sustainability across the region. One is the way in which China is approaching some of the issues, and China obviously is featuring a lot today. The second is a very specific issue um, that's playing out still in Japan in relation to its nuclear power fleet. A third is the common and different approaches that have been taken to the development of unconventional shale and, and, and coal seam gas in, in Australia and the US. And fourthly, touch very briefly upon, again, the similarities and differences in terms of how uh, climate change policy is going to start to impact at some point in the near future. Firstly, in relation to China, I was in China um, last week, and some of you may have seen the, the, the air pollution indices. I mean, the, the outlook, look out the window today. I mean, in China, like Beijing last week, um, it was like yesterday in, in Washington. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't go away um, the next day. It's a real problem. Um, it's just as bad as it was last year, uh, despite the fact that uh, power stations have been shut down. So this is a real, a real issue. And the p policy makers that I've been talking to in, in some of the work we've been doing there is, um, are very acutely aware of this and themselves have linked this to the things they need to do about reducing the dependence on coal. Uh, moves to gas and, and increasingly removes, moves towards renewable energy, in, in, energy. But at the same time, they share exactly the same views that the, the policy makers in Australia and the US have, and that is they don't want to see electricity prices go up. They may very well have a, a fundamentally different approach to the way the markets operate, but they're just as concerned about the impacts of electricity prices if they start to impose um, higher costs on their energy supply system. They had a, a major problem with the way in which the PV industry played out in China, went from boom to bust and may be coming back again, and they're very concerned to make sure that that doesn't happen in relation to solar thermal energy, and the piece of the work that I've been working on with them at the moment is how they think about a technology that is simply going nowhere, really, in the case of the United States and Australia, and that is technologies called carbon capture and storage, which have particularly interesting opportunities in China. I think also the, the, the Chinese policymakers in the NDRC that I've been talking to uh, are very committed to the 40% target that they have to improve the energy intensity of the Chinese economy. And they're seriously starting to talk about what they might put on the table in 2015 ahead of the uh, meetings in, in, in Paris. And finally, uh, I think equally importantly in this area, um, they are seriously concerned about the uh, way in which the emissions, the emissions trading schemes that they're starting to implement will work. It looks like they're starting to work. The companies I've spoken to uh, are very comfortable with the way it's going. Uh, the carbon prices will probably be in the similar range to the carbon prices in California today, and we'll see how that plays out. But you know, a lot of the things that, um, uh, that we see being discussed in Australia and the US are, are also being debated in China. So I think there's some... And there's some very important issues that are, going to, that, that are going to impact on us. The second issue is Japan. I mean, this time last year, um, I think it was a bit later in the year, Robert, we had the Alliance 21 discussion about energy and resources, and one of the Japanese companies there was saying that they expected that somewhere between a half and two-thirds of the 50 Japanese nuclear power stations might come back on stream in the near future. Now, as most of you know, none of them has come back on stream yet. And talking to people from the Japanese Atomic Energy Commission only in November, they were telling me that now they think somewhere between a third and a half might come back on stream. Now that has a lot of implications, not just for Japan, but of course the Japanese are paying very high prices for gas. $18, $19 a gigajoule MMBTU, and we're complaining in Australia about paying 8 or 9 and of course in the US gas prices have been around uh, 3 or 4 So there's dramatic differences in that. How that plays out is going to have an impact because, not surprisingly, the Japanese, Chinese, Koreans and Indians are very concerned about the prices they're paying for gas into the region and are starting to put some real pressure on what have traditionally been the way in which the gas prices have been set. That has big implications for us as suppliers to the region, both as competitors and as cooperators, if there's such a word. So I think how that plays out will be important. The third issue is I want to touch upon briefly because it has so dramatically changed the scope of the, energies, uh, the energy sphere, and that is the unconventional gas and oil. But in how differently and how much the same these two things have played out. The technologies that are being used are almost exactly the same. Uh, for example, ConocoPhillips 
came to Australia in the 90s and brought into Australia, into Queensland, coal seam gas fracking technologies. They had a lot of trouble getting it to work and left, left Australia having spent something of the order of $100 million, but now they're back in a joint venture with one of the Australian listed companies that I used to work for and now uh, are going strongly ahead as part of a $60 billion expansion of LNG facilities in Queensland, such that within only a few years, Australia will almost certainly be the number one exporter of LNG in the world going past Qatar. How long that will be sustained, of course, is also challenging because at the same time as this is happening, the cost of doing business in Australia have been increasing and already it looks like the fourth of what was going to be four large LNG facilities in Queensland supported by PetroChina and Shell may not go ahead. Now, that last comment I made also, I think to me, is also interesting in that I mentioned the word PetroChina because what you're also seeing in this sector is an awful lot of cross-ownership. Companies who are taking, taking equity positions in the assets in other countries to provide greater security of supply, obviously. But the way in which those commercial relationships will interplay with the political national interests is not going to be simple. And the way policymakers respond, respond to that, I think, is going to be challenging. The technologies associated with unconventional oil and gas are challenging. In Australia, we have a moratorium on fracking. In Victoria, we have a very vigorous debate about the technology in New South Wales, and yet we have over 4,000 individual deals have been signed with agricultural farm owners in, um, in Queensland. Remembering the big difference, by the way, in Australia and the US is that in Australia, the farmers don't own the assets under the ground, the poor space, whereas in the US, obviously, it's quite different, and that has some big implications for the way this plays out. Um, the other thing I mentioned very, just very briefly is the very, uh, very interestingly and different ways in which the response to climate change is playing out in our two countries. In China, as I mentioned, they're taking a, a somewhat multi-directional approach. There's a lot of things starting to happen uh, already. In only a few years ago, I think people would have thought it's quite possible that Australia and the US would both have had cap and trade emissions trading schemes. Now in both countries, that in, within probably a year or so, that will be the case that neither of us will have such a scheme. But on the other hand, in both countries, greenhouse gas emissions have been going down for slightly different reasons. And in the US, gas has been a large player and a large, has taken a large responsibility for the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions with a move away from coal to wood gas. In Australia, emissions have gone down, but gas has actually played a very small part. So it's in despite the fact that Australia is going to be the largest, one of the largest producers in the world of LNG. So the dynamic, while there are similarities, there are also big differences in the way this is playing out. So in summary, it seems to be that what's emerging is, a, is not so much uncertainty, because we've always had uncertainty, but it's the range of plausible scenarios which seem to be much wider than they've been for a long time. And I don't want to give Ian too much of a hard time, but I can remember someone from Exxon coming to Australia not very long ago and talking about how the Exxon's view of the, of the world's supply and demand was looking, and gas hardly figured at all. And it wasn't that long ago, as most of you would know, that the US was looking to import LNG into this country. How dramatically that's changed. And when you look at the current forecasts from com companies like BP, and I suspect to some extent ExxonMobil, which now show 30 or 40 years of growth and the US becoming a net exporter of natural gas, do you really believe those forecasts or do you simply take them into account in the way you're thinking about um, policy and the way you're thinking about investment? So, for me, the questions that are emerging are, will Australia and China have their own shale gas booms? It's quite possible. The in-place reserves look the resource looks to be there, but are they recoverable? If and when will Japan return to nuclear power? Who will be the other competitors and where will the gas prices settle in the region? Canada, Mozambique and so forth. How will those commercial cross-ownership arrangements impact on national interests? And finally, when and how will climate change policies start to bite in the region? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, as a relative newcomer uh, at, at, in um, ExxonMobil, you don't have to defend their past forecasts. <laughs> uh, but, but you can perhaps tell us of, of, of the company's uh, current outlook as well as your experience in the region. Thanks so much. I'll do exactly that. In fact, I, I'm very grateful to Tony for that lead-in. Uh, I just want to say, though, to begin with, that uh, like Robert, I underst un understood his 
temptation to get involved in the previous regional security panel. Uh, surrounded by former colleagues and as a former Australian diplomat and foreign policy advisor, I do need to remember who I currently am, and that is the uh, head for Asia Pacific of government relations for ExxonMobil. Um, I do want to, along the way, draw on my most recent uh, government experience as Australian High Commissioner in Papua New Guinea, but I would indeed like to begin with uh, a, a very quick set of points drawn from our current energy outlook. Uh, I, don't, I wasn't there at the time, Tony, but I, if that is the case, it certainly has changed. Um, let me give us a quick plug. Uh, our expectations and calculations for energy outlook through to 2040 are contained in our very recently updated and, and reissued energy outlook. Uh, it's available, of course, on our website. And I will be drawing a bit on that. Let me say a few things about global and regional, importantly, regional energy demand. We expect that as global economic output more than doubles by 2040, energy demand will increase by about 35%. Energy demand in Asia will drive nearly all the global increase, rising by about 60%. So at one level, uh, the demand will continue in the foreseeable future, I would argue creating opportunities for both Australia and the United States and others. The question of sustainability is, is a very important one. The climate change uh, challenge at a global level manifests itself in uh, very serious national and regional environmental concerns across the Asia Pacific. We, we expect, and our energy outlook goes into this in some detail, that gains in efficiency across economies worldwide through energy saving practices and technologies will calibrate growth in demand. We expect that efficiency alone will account for energy savings in the order of 500 quadrillion BTUs between now and 2040. Uh, thinking more about this picture in the region, economic output will triple in non-OECD Asia Pacific between now and 2040, but demand will increase, as I've mentioned, only by 60%, reflecting a high level of energy Im improvement, even in that region, and some shift of the economy towards the services sector, particularly in China. Growth in the mix of energy resources available to the region will also make a contribution here we get close to Tony's point. Demand in the Asia Pacific for natural gas, which compared to other sources is widely available, versatile, affordable and produces low emissions, is expected to nearly double by 2025 and continue to grow through to 2040. Here in the United States, the IEA uh, states that there has been a 7% reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions since 2006 and that the shift uh, from coal towards natural gas in the power generation sector has been a significant element in that shift. Domestic gas production, we believe, in Asia will continue to climb but at a slower rate than demand, meaning we'll see a growing reliance on gas imports in Asia and continuing opportunity for countries like Australia and the United States Got, returning to my more recent experience in Papua New Guinea, it's worth talking to you a little bit about that because it serves in my mind as the perfect totem for collaboration between the United States and Australia in the Asia Pacific region. The ExxonMobil led PNG LNG project is exactly that. Uh, it's a project which is viewed, I can say with some certainty, by the government and people of Papua New Guinea as central to their nat national development aspirations. It's a big project, 6.9 million <clears throat> tonnes per annum, an investum, investment of something in the order of 20 billion US dollars. And despite challenges, it's now 90% complete. Hundreds of miles of pipeline have been built. A major LNG plant has been built outside Moresby. And the first cargoes to key strategic markets in Japan, Korea and China will commence this year. It has strong Australian involvement. Apart from ExxonMobil, our largest two commercial code venturers are Australian registered Santos and Oil Search. The Australian government's decision to provide uh, initial finance through the Export Finance and Investment uh, uh, Facility uh, was crucial 
to the uh, accumulation of finance that led to FID in, in late 2009. Uh, the Australian Government has been, has been working alongside the project, helping Papua New Guinea develop sovereign wealth fund mechanisms to manage the revenue from this project and others across the country. So uh, there has been very strong collaboration at that level. At the strategic uh, community investment level, uh, the sorts of things that companies like ExxonMobil, we're not alone in this, uh, our colleagues and competitors represented in the room are also good in this area. Uh, but our work in education, women's empowerment, health and the environment in Papua New Guinea complement very well the very significant development resources that are put into that country and have been for 40 years now by the Australian Government. Uh, Training collaboration between US industry and the Australian government has been very strong in the context of building a 9,000 person Papua New Guinean workforce. And the involvement goes on, including uh, in, the, in areas like child and maternal health. Um, on Papua New Guinea, I'd just say this. I would say that Papua New Guineans themselves are the first to point out and recognise that it is for their own government to lead the way in translating uh, the revenue that comes from a project like this into genuine and sustainable development for all. But I think Americans and Australians recognise uh, that there is a role for sensibly getting involved in support of government's national development strategies. So a very good example, I think, for collaboration between the two countries. And collaboration remains my theme. As I, as I just move to the last part of this, these few remarks, I'd, I'd take a step back and refer to a couple of the points that have been made earlier. Yes, the US now has access to abundant natural gas resources, which can meet and exceed its domestic, dom domestic needs and allow for exports. And yes, projects in Australia and Papua New Guinea are set to be important elements in LNG supply to Asia in coming years, very important. I think it'd be simplistic and, and wrong to reduce the picture to one which highlights potential competition between the United States and Australia. Yes, changes in the US uh, will likely form part of the global energy landscape over time, but there's, there are many other variables at play in Asia. If you look at China, uh, for example, there's so many factors, the scale of pipeline imports from Central Asia and Russia, the future of domestic shale production, domestic demand policies, resource pricing, industry reform. It's a <coughs> complex picture and should not be simplified. And, of course, in thinking about our respective interests in Asian energy supply, it's useful to reflect on the extent of US investment in the Australia, Australian gas sector. My company is one of several represented here today that is involved. Uh, it provides a good example through its long-standing involvement in domestic supply in Australia, through its Bass Strait operations and associated onshore development in Gippsland, through its partnership with Chevron, in the export-focused Gorgon Jantz uh, LNG project, as well as with BHP Billiton and the Scarborough LNG development effort. In any case, experience in both our countries tells us that evolving demand and supply patterns will open the door for increased global trade opportunities. And that change in landscape will help create higher overall value for the entire global economy uh, and improve standards worldwide including for Australia and for the United States. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hawkins. Very good. Uh, first off, thank you everyone for making it out. Uh, I know that Washington's often challenged in snow. I also want to thank the Alliance 21 uh, team for putting this together. I attended one of their meetings in Sydney not too long ago, and this is an incredibly important project, and I think uh, the discussions here today will help fuel um, good thoughts and good work uh, between our two countries. Ambassador Hill already got into sustainable development. It really is the issue for our time. It's geopolitical, which many of you care about. It's scientific, it's engineering, but it's also economic. And so, as a framing, I think we have to think about global climate change, food and water for the emerging population on the planet, public health. These issues like uh, air pollution, which were already mentioned, are extraordinarily severe in some cities. Um, 
So what does Dow Chemical do and why am I up here? The, the key reason is we're a science and engineering company and we really operate at the intersection of energy and uh, material science. And so when you think about chemistry, material science, you might say, well, why do I care if I'm sitting in this room? Well, almost every product you buy, if you go to Ikea, you go to Kroger, almost every product you buy is enabled by chemistry. You know, if you take something like your iPhone, virtually every part of your iPhone was enabled by chemistry. And the, the, the chips, the screen, everything. And so you, you need to have a context that chemistry, not just my company, but this whole industry, is really providing these products or enabling companies to make them in the automotive sector, light weighting of vehicles, food, production, water, uh, medicines, public health, building materials, <clears throat> energy efficiency <clears throat> was already mentioned. Uh, that gets back into uh, insulation and other technologies, personal care products, and actually the direct production of energy uh, from oil and gas fields is enabled by chemistry, but also solar technology, wind, and others. So chemistry and material science is kind of right in that sweet spot. And therefore, it really underpins manufacturing and products, and therefore, unsustainable manufacturing and sus or sustainable manufacturing or unsustainable products or sustainable products. So we've got to give a lot of thought to these areas. Um, it's very complex. There's a lot at stake for our two countries uh, in terms of policy and technology, but really for everybody on the planet. So when you get into chemistry and advanced materials, how do you actually produce these things? There are really three key components. One is know-how. Um, this is really high-tech, it's, it's not low-tech work. There's a lot of PhDs, I'm talking hundreds of thousands in our companies that are experts in how you convert materials. And so at its core, you know, STEM and science and engineering education is very important. But what do those people with the know-how take and do something with? Two things, raw materials and energy. To really be in the world of materials, that's what you have, raw materials and energy. And often, and this is the key point, often people don't realize they're the same thing. Okay, not with nuclear in Japan, but with virtually most of the other major energy sources, <clears throat> oil, it's energy, but it's also raw material. Coal, energy, but it can be a raw material. Natural gas, energy and raw material. Biomass, so uh, uh, things growing out in fields. And then ultimately later, recycle materials. So what you throw in your trash is also a source of energy potentially, as well as a raw material. Um, so when we go all the way back up to where Ambassador Hill started us in sustainable development, um, you really have to, I think, make your way back through this whole materials issue as well, it ends up with the energy issues. And to me, that's really a sweet spot for Alliance 21, for the U.S. Study Center, and really for our two countries. We need to be very smart, very astute in how we think about these opportunities. Um, we're private sector uh, people here, but we're also government sector as well as NGOs. And there's a role to play in thinking about policy. So when you get into shale gas and unconventional gas, this is a gift that we're all blessed with in our two countries. But you need to think about the feedstock value and the energy value of those and the relative balance. Also, the special role um, gas has to play, it was mentioned earlier, in helping transition to a more sustainable energy future for the planet. Gas is one of the only things we have in our, in our quiver right now 
to really get at a transition to address global climate change. And where you're using gas to produce plastics and polymers, what a lot of people don't realize is that when you put that into play in the right form of plastic, it can be recycled. But at its end of life, it is an energy source. Europe uses a lot of waste, for example, in, in providing power. So we need to think about that. Coal, already mentioned, the greenhouse gas side, but also the air pollutant side. And in China in particular, that's become a crisis, a real crisis in Beijing. Biomass, uh, it sounds good, and everybody wants to get excited about fueling their vehicles off of uh, cellulosic materials, but there's a lot of research and technology to go there. Um, and there are a lot of other considerations in biomass um, in terms of taking over fields that are needed for feeding people and destroying ecosystems. So you need to be looking at uh, life cycle analyses of comparing uh, coal, uh, sorry, coal, gas, and biomass. And sometimes you'd be surprised at those results. And last, this whole recycle of materials like plastic as well as waste. There's a whole host of uh, issues there we could begin to address. But how we manage across all of these energy sources and material sources, in my view, will determine if we as a people uh, can achieve sustainable development on the planet. And, and that to me is the key thing that we have to work on. But it, it, it requires us to work and think about balance between economy, social issues, and environment. So unfettered anything in this context is not necessarily the best thing. But I would say, as I watch, and I'm not a diplomat like some of you in this room um, and here on the panel, I don't see where we're having the debates as a, as, a, as a people, when I say a people, I mean the global community, on what do we want to achieve in global sustainable development. And I'm saying including economy, including social, including environment. And that to me is a big opportunity between our two countries. We have a lot of similarities in terms of our supply of uh, energy, a lot of similarities in our economies, a lot of similarities of values, and it's, it's really important that at the 30,000 foot view, there is debate about what we're trying to do as a planet. I believe the next level below that is what is an advanced manufacturing policy that leads to more sustainable manufacturing, more sustainable products. But again, there needs to be a thought process for that. Next level is energy and raw material policy, how that all fits. And then I think the, the last area is technology and, and how the technology policies that would enable it. So to me, that's where the real opportunity lies. And I applaud Alliance 21 for making that a key priority of its policy uh, work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil, and, and thank you for reminding us that um, innovation takes place not only in extraction, but also the use of resources and, and, and energy, and as well as the policy environment um, that is necessary to nurture and advance uh, the kind of uh, technology necessary for future, more sustainable use of, of resources. Uh, we have um, maybe 20 minutes for q and I would remind you that uh, this panel is between you and lunch, so please make your questions succinct uh, so that uh, we can take full advantage of the expertise that's on uh, the panel. First question, sir. I could address this to um, Tony Wood. You, you mentioned that the evolution in gas production and, and gas pricing between markets is leading to pressure on the traditional long-term system of pricing gas through long-term contracts. Um, are you, do you think there's a possibility of seeing a, 
a serious or accelerated development of more of a, uh, a market that's based on short-term um, short contracts of LNG deliveries or perhaps even a spot market? And if so, what are the implications of that for both Australian and American producers and possibly the competition between them? Um, because I had nothing better to do over Christmas, I read one of Daniel Jurgen's books. And if any of you have tried to read these books, they're A, very readable, but they're slightly thick. Um, and, it, and your question reminded me of some of the content of that because he told some of the stories about the way in which these markets tend to move through cycles. And it seems to me we are moving through that cycle at the moment. So I think we are going to see a move in which we'll see more spot market and less long-term market. But as you're also at the same time as that, and that tends to reflect maturity in markets generally, but at the same time, we're also seeing this expansion of, of new markets, and that means usually more longer-term contracts to underpin those. So, for example, those big LNG projects in Australia that I mentioned before, the ones that are going to start producing gas this year are underpinned by long-term contracts. The next tranche of projects may not be. So I think we're seeing, we are seeing that cycle. I'm not suggesting for a second that it's going to be a fundamental and quick change, but I think both in Australia, in, in the region and in Europe already, you're starting to see a move in which a greater emphasis on spot markets will occur. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to mean necessarily high or low prices for anybody. I think that dynamic is, is, is very challenging. And as I said before, there are very divergent, plausible scenarios depending upon supply and demand. Um, Right now, there will be people who could give you a plausible gas price in, in Asia, which will stay at closer to $18 or $19. Equally, you can come up with a plausible scenario, which brings you down to $12 or $13. I wouldn't bet my money on either of those two. Some people will bet their shareholders' money. And if I was government, I'd keep away from it for a while yet from a policy perspective. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Tony. As you've already pointed out, uh, many of our export projects, uh, the ones in Western Australia, uh, are very expensive projects. And so there will likely to be a period of time, a transitional period, where long-term take-or-pay contracts indexed to oil or, or some other uh, uh, price stabilizer would be necessary to make those projects financeable, if nothing else. Uh, the other issue in terms of U.S. LNG exports is that now, Henry Hub prices may be 440 this morning. Uh, it's already risen quite a bit from the lows below $3, but it's going to take another seven, eight dollars per million BTU to get it to the Northeast uh, Asian markets on, on terminals that, that are not yet completed. So it, it, it's probably going to be a longer transition that, that some people w w would wish. Um, next question. One thing we didn't talk very much, uh, although it's touched upon in terms of greenhouse gas emissions um, as well as sustainability, is that both of our, our countries are, are big coal exporters. Um, Australia is the, among the top two, I believe. Um, U.S. coal exports are increasing, uh, particularly because of the substitution of, of natural gas in, in the power sector. We've seen Ironically, European coal imports increasing. Um, coals to Newcastle is kind of an outdated saying now because they are importing coal uh, in New Newcastle. Germany's greenhouse gas emissions have increased. We've seen European uh, at both at the na national level with the new German government as well as the EU just today announcing uh, a rethink uh, on the policy on renewables and, and so on. I might just pose this to, to the panel. Um, where do you see coal fitting in uh, to the energy mix, uh, given sustainability, greenhouse gas emissions concerns, but the stake that both our countries have uh, on, on uh, a more effective, efficient use of coal? I go. Yes, um, it, it's interesting for us from an Australian perspective, as we normally say, we're the world's largest exporter of coal and we're about to become the world's largest exporter of LNG. Um, but from a, um, a global... Well, the, the first point is that uh, demand for both 
uh, within Asia is expected to grow for the foreseeable future. Um, from a sustainability perspective and climate change in particular, uh, a, the better solution is natural gas by, by far. Uh, and from an air quality perspective, it's also natural gas by, by far. So, um, you know, we're not going to, um, uh, I mentioned um, resource scarcity. If China still requires coal to feed its uh, growing economy to lift more millions, hundreds of millions out of poverty, um, then um, Australia will, um, will help meet that market. Uh, but if, if a result of our policies, there is more natural gas available, uh, and they would prefer to purchase that, subject to price and other considerations, uh, then we would want to be contributing to that, uh, to that growth as well. I, um, I think you've put your finger on what seems to me to be one of the significant conundrums in, the, in this whole debate around sustainability and energy and supply and, and, and climate change because you, know, you just look at the numbers and the numbers tell you that, and, and IA numbers, OECD numbers, uh, World Bank numbers tell you that um, we already have um, four times the amount of gas on our reserves in the world that we'll ever burn if we're going to meet supposedly meet the climate change objectives which are consistent with the two degree target to which all the countries supposedly signed up. And so how do you square that circle? Um, we had a bit of this discussion at the Alliance 21 meeting last year. And um, one answer is, well, financiers don't believe that countries are actually going to move on climate change. Or um, the markets have got it wrong. And there's going to be an enormous correction at some point. Um, or it's all down to solar flares. Or, or, or. And I, I don't know what the answer is yet, but I guess it's one of the interesting questions as to how that's going to be resolved. Um, the only other technology answer I can think of, and, and Neil mentioned technology, is the technology is known as carbon capture and storage. But there wouldn't there'd be, I suspect, many in the people in this room who would say, well, that doesn't work, it's too expensive, or something else. So I, I, I don't, I don't, at the moment, I don't see the answer that connects those two questions. And for me, it remains the fundamental conundrum as we have seen a move away from what was supposed to be peak energy to the point where it's an enormously fantastic opportunity for the people in the world who do not have access to energy to underpin their economies, and yet we have this conundrum of climate change. I'm Andre Sovazo, and I'm the chief representative for the Interstate Traveler Company in Vietnam. Uh, my question is just uh, kind of US-centered, but um, since we do have such copious um, natural gas uh, resources, why don't we use uh, CNG, that is compre compressed natural gas, to fuel our own automobiles you know, filling stations for them and stuff like that, instead of exporting it to countries like Pakistan, which I understand use nat uh, CNG for about 70% of their personal automobiles already. Uh, that's my question. So perhaps I refer this question to Mr. Hawkins, because uh, Dow does have a position on the, the scale of uh, uh, potential U.S. Uh, gas exports. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to get into the the specifics that uh, were underpin the question, but I, I think without real uh, policy agreement around what we're trying to achieve. Um, including in the last question, which was uh, about coal, um, it, you, you have confusing signals to companies um, that are making the investments. Most of the investments are being made by companies, not by governments. And, and so when you have a cacophony of signals around where things will end up, um, no one is going to invest my opinion, in a, in a natural gas uh, distribution system for automotive 
without a policy environment that guarantees that for the next 30 years, there's a real market for that. And so, to me, all of this comes back to a lack of a policy environment. Uh, the companies involved, and there are thousands of them, not, not a few, are, you know, reacting to, you know, opportunistic uh, sales, and they can't be faulted for doing that. But I think we as two, two countries and governments and others that are here, if we really want in 2050 to have a more sustainable planet, we need to actually be thoughtful around what do we want our automotive uh, situation to look like? What do we want uh, in terms of uh, technologies for coal uh, to make it more sustainable so that it has a longer life? But Right now, none of that is defined, and I, I think that's the fundamental, and I can't see you there, sorry, sir. The fundamental reason why you have conundrums like that is there's no agreement, and you have companies that need to sell product today, and that's, that's where we are. Uh, Ian, so, I'm, I'm sure Exxon looked at this uh, in your latest forecast, and, and there have been developments in terms of CNG use in transportation fuel, uh, heavy trucks, and, and, and so on, so please. Certainly it's an area of focus, but I, I don't really want to get into the specifics. What I do want to say is that the, uh, where, where we would very much agree, Neil and I, is uh, on the importance of policy clarity from governments. Uh, we, um, uh, we take a view, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, it isn't a zero-sum situation, that the, uh, the abundance of gas here in the United States allows for uh, domestic and um, uh, international needs to be addressed. Um, but I would also say that uh, in whatever policy environment it evolves, uh, a central, central emphasis needs to be put on the importance of the free flow of uh, investment and of, and of trading decisions. Can I, can I just say that from an Australian policy point of view, uh, the Australian government, the new Australian government is in the process of developing a new white paper on energy uh, and to facilitate that process uh, just before Christmas put out a discussion paper uh, and for, I, think, I think for the first time seriously raised the issue of um, uh, a natural gas infrastructure in relation to heavy transport vehicles for Australia. So. Uh, the, the, the public policy is still a way out there, but the discussion, this discussion is starting. Uh, and from a sustainability perspective, uh, I would argue, of course, that that is a good thing. It's, it's interesting to hear both uh, folks on the panel with government experience as well as industry experience to, to ask for a better government policy. Sometimes uh, you, you don't really want what you wish for. Uh, we, we, we've seen uh, in, in our country here the sort of unintended consequences of, of ethanol mandates in, in the transportation, uh, transportation fuel sector uh, that, that may be uh, assuming that a, a better knowledge of the future than, than sometimes we can forecast. So it's, I'm sure you're all talking about sound policy environment that, that, that will be generated by discussions like this. There was another question over on this side. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Alan Lee. I'm a climate risk specialist at the World Bank here in Washington. Uh, my question is for all panelists, but in particular Ambassador Hill. Um, the World Trade Organization rules um, currently um, have an intention to provide for clean technology to um, provisions to be enabled, and yet the, the same rules also prevent them because they haven't had specific, specific enabling regulation. So the question is, what role do you think trade agreements, whether through the WTO or perhaps bilaterally, plurilaterally, can play to allow for countries to pursue well-intentioned clean technology policies domestically? Um, well, I don't know, it was probably better directed to the next panel that's dealing with the specific trade, um, trade issues. Uh, it's uh, the, um, the, the clash between environmental policy and um, the goal of free trade. 
has always been there and always been part of the part of the debate. Um, but uh, I don't think I can contribute any more. Tony, have you got a, a view? Uh, well, again, I'm certainly not an expert on the, the trade side of things. I'm aware of some of the some of the issues. Um, in fact, we were discussing some of these um, a couple of night, nights ago. But I think that the, the, the underpinning thing, and, and Neil referred to this, and that is that um, the interplay between policy and technology is so fundamental. We've seen so much of what we enjoy today in the West and, 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 in the other part, and even the developing economies being driven by that combination. And how that's going to play out, is, in, in particularly in relation to climate change, the, the point you raised, is, is fundamentally important. Um, clearly, intellectual property rights are going to have to be protected, and I guess that will come up in the next session. But the issue of how technology gets dispersed is, is fundamental. I mean, look what happened with solar PV. I mentioned before about how difficult it is to forecast anything in this whole space. No one that I know of got that right in terms of how quickly solar PV costs would fall, and particularly as you saw the movement of the technology around the world. I mean, BP in Australia had a 20 megawatt facility for a year, and that was world scale. And now we've got companies, uh, you know, many gigawatts of capacity in, in China. So you know, that happened dramatically. So that, for me, that whole interface between technology and policy is going to be fundamental in getting clarity around the sort of policies that are going to uh, underpin putting a value on emissions is going to be core to the way in which technology gets initiated and gets deployed. I would only add that, as with government policy, uh, the shape of international trade negotiations um, needs to, as I've mentioned before, continue to support uh, the free flow of capital goods and services. Uh, research and development technology is something that's, uh, that's very important to any company involved in this sector, and uh, you know, like us, other companies invest a great deal in it. Uh, it's important that continue. It's important that that collaborative spirit continue in the in the partnership between Australia and, and the United States. But it's that point about the importance of uh, the free flow of goods, services, and capital that uh, means that you know we and and others, many others in this room, support the general shape of the TPP negotiations that are currently underway. Hi, uh, Jenny Mandel with Energy Wire. Um, I have a question uh, uh, speci specifically for you, Mr. Hawkins, about uh, Dow Chemical. It's been a company that's been very um, active in the debate about natural gas usage and exports in the United States. And um, because Australia is further along in that process and it's a little bit easier to see sort of where markets are heading, um, interested in, in how you see that. Um, the pricing pressure is shaping up, and to what extent is the position that's being um, uh, advocated here in the U.S. about sort of moving more slowly with exports, you know, to what extent is that uh, informed by the Australian experience, and where do you see the, the Australian uh, interest for companies like yours shaping up over the next uh, number of years? Well, what <clears throat> what's driving our thinking more than anything else is the destruction of manufacturing industries in this country, and I would I would guess uh, also in Australia, there's been similar uh, change um, where the lack of a policy environment of uh, supporting manufacturing has led to a lot of problems uh, here. And the natural gas that's been found in the United States, the lower cost gas, has enabled a tremendous amount of investment. Uh, we're, we're investing I think four to five billion dollars in, in the Gulf Coast area. Um, and that could not have been foreseen a decade ago or uh, five years ago even probably. So um, it's created opportunities in the United States. Um, I would assume there are similar opportunities that have been created in Australia to, to build more value added manufacturing and supply for, for local economies. We're very uh, strong supporters of free trade, um, but we do believe there needs to be a policy environment around advanced manufacturing that leads to uh, that kind of economic development within, within countries as well. Yeah, can I just add one point to that? I think just in relation to the, uh, the Australian context, and it's certainly not a, a, a debate-free area in terms of the impact, because I think when you look at what happened in the two countries, 
Uh, in both cases, markets worked and price worked. So in the US, you had very high gas prices, drove, combined with technology, it drove down the price of gas and the availability of gas. In Australia, it wasn't the domestic high prices that were the issue, it was the attraction of the high prices in the Asian region, where you could see the opportunity to develop LNG and export the gas into, into, into Asia, which drove those investments. So these were, wouldn't have happened without the export market, and Australia will end up exporting something like 90% of the gas it produces, whereas the US is almost exactly the opposite, I suspect. And that has meant, of course, that the gas prices in Australia, which had been 3 or $4, have risen very quickly and look like they'll go up high and then probably come back down again as competition starts to work. Therefore, you, are, uh, you end up at exactly the place Neil was, and there's, what do you do about the manufacturing that's impacted by these movements in gas prices? And this has been a challenging issue for the government in terms of policy. Uh, from a policy perspective, the position we've always taken at Grattan is that, you know, generally speaking, the history of Australia has been more, tr more free trade is better and less free trade is bad. Um, how you think about that becomes very important, and it is, a, it is a furious debate. It's taking place right now in Australia, and it's not finished yet. John Brenton, I'm the Australian Vice Consul based in LA. You've talked a little bit about how the West is moving away from you know, carbon pricing, and we've talked a little bit about energy prices, but you haven't touched on the cost of mitigation. So I was just wondering, when we're talking about global energy prices and global demand, how consumers are end up going to pay for the mitigation of climate change on the other end, and how you see that factoring in current discussions in a public policy point of view? Uh, well, in this country, one thing we don't see is tax which I understand has also been a election uh, issue in Australia recently. So who, who on the panel want to tackle that? Well, if um, you... I know that there, there's, there's an argument to read the Stern report and so forth about the costs of inaction that need to be fed into the debate <coughs> as well, but basically um, leaving that to one side, public policies for mitigation are going to, are going to cost. Um, and that can be you know, managed in a, through a whole range of different ways. And you, you're, you're seeing it within the United States, where in, the, in California, and I think now Washington and Oregon are joining, the, the principal um, policy lever is, is and it's going to further develop as a cap-and-trade scheme, whereas from a national perspective, uh, President Obama's principally using his regulatory powers, uh, and so emission, state, emission uh, uh, prescriptions on power stations and the like are the tools that, um, that he can use. But in the end, it, it, nevertheless, um, it nevertheless gets fed into, into price. Uh, in Australia, we will be moving into a new experiment where the, the new Australian government is adopting what it calls a direct action plan, which is basically purchasing the cost of, with, pu with public money, purchasing the cost of, um, of uh, reductions in carbon intensity. So um, businesses will be able to bid for part of that public, public fund uh, if they can um, demonstrate improvements on a from a business in reducing carbon from a business as usual trajectory, uh, and if their improvements uh, are more cost effective than the, than their competitors, if that if I'm making that clear, so um, and that will be another experiment and um, uh, less market orientated, um, not as um, not as um, uh, not as prescriptive as the Obama approach, somewhere, somewhere in between, but it is still going to cost the public purse in the end, and that's in the end is a, a cost to consumers. I think, yeah. Mark, the other issue about this is that two things. One is the evidence is that markets produce lower prices than other mechanisms. So if we are going to start to move on this, then mechanisms that look more like markets will produce a lower outcome. And, and we certainly done research on that and compared all sorts of other possibilities, the evidence is very clear. Now, whether or not 
the current approach that the Australian government is taking will actually end up being a pseudo market anyway and would produce effectively a shadow carbon price as a somewhat esoteric debate for policy wonks, I suspect. Um, the other side of it is interesting, and it comes back to this point about um, the need for clarity in terms of long-term approach to this, because the investments that many companies are making in coal, oil and gas and so forth are long-term investments. And worrying about are we going to meet our 2020 target seems almost, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's trivial by any means, but it doesn't help the discussion about those investments. So what's interesting is, and I might refer you to a, a short article that was in The Economist in December, and it looked at the internal carbon pricing that was being used by major corporations in, in this country, in the United States. And large companies, um, ExxonMobil, Shell, BP and so forth, they're using carbon prices internally to assess long-term investments all in excess of $30 a tonne. Now, those, that number is well in ahead of the number that's currently on the table in Australia that we're debating furiously as being too high. So there's some interesting tensions about why are companies who've got that long-term view taking that perspective when at the same time you've got this furious discussion about whether we can afford to have carbon prices which are well below twenty dollars a tonne. It's a, again a, a, an interesting conundrum, I think. Yeah, I would just add uh, on the cap and trade question. You know, Dow was part of U.S. cap, and we put a lot of capital into trying to get cap and trade through, and it failed. And the policy environment here now is has a, that is evaporated. That is not going to happen here anytime soon. So to the other part of your question, um, you know, the models are pretty clear. So if you believe the models, we're in for trillions and trillions of dollars of, of uh, investment that's going to have to be made. Um, so it's kind of like the old commercial, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And be because there's no debate, uh, meaningful debate that could lead to answering these kind of policy questions. It, it puts you more in a pay me later mode. But when you start looking at the, the totals for a New York City, how much money it would take for them to deal with sea level rise, as soon as that begins to get close to really needing to happen, that will force an investment, I mean a, a debate, because New York won't want to pay for that by itself. Okay, the other thing is insurers there you can back you can back uh, carbon pricing back into a system through insurers but that that will take a long time and so the issue is do you try to get ahead of it to slow the emissions or do you write it off and say we'll deal with it later but it gets very expensive and there are a lot of ecosystem impacts and other other impacts to do it later and that's the dilemma we have. You know, one of the themes, I guess the theme of this conference is uh, the, the, how the t our two countries are going to address in emerging Asia. And, and uh, there's no area where that is brought to um, uh, sharper relief, it seems to me, than, than in energy, where we are both large energy producers, our countries, and, and, and exporters uh, uh, as well. Uh, Asia is clearly the, the, the region of the world where energy demand growth will, will be um, uh, continue to accelerate, not only in China, which is mentioned a great deal, but also Southeast Asia, which has been a net energy uh, exporter, is now becoming a net energy importer. We've got India maybe already over the horizon. Uh, I was wondering whether the panel address whether, you know, I'm, I'm sure both our countries, certainly the United States, has bilateral energy dialogues with, with China and, and other countries that frankly hasn't borne much fruit. Uh, uh, on, on the other end, we've had a hundred plus uh, uh, country UN uh, managed process that also haven't gone very far uh, in terms of addressing the, the issues that you brought up. Do you see scope for a Pacific, Asian, ASEAN plus some kind of multilateral uh, dialogue that involves both energy producers such as ourselves as well as major energy consumers in, in, in Asia uh, to, uh, uh, to cooperate more in this area, including 
on more efficient, effective use of, of energy um, and, and, green, uh, and mitigating uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, there's, there's actually a, a lot of discussion of the issues that, um, within all of the regional organisations as well and bilaterally, say, between us and, uh, us and China. Um, but um, in the end, as we, you know, it was supposed to, things were supposed to happen differently after Kyoto. Kyoto was, was the only binding agreement on climate change that's been reached, and that was only among developed countries. The plan was ultimately that there, it would be expanded into an agreement in developing countries, and that is still a work in progress, and personally I think it's still a fair way out there if in fact it ever ever happened. So in the end, it's, it's domestic decisions that, uh, uh, that count. So, in, but the reality is that in the developed world, basically emission levels have, have reduced and are going to reduce even more. Part of it's a transfer to natural gas. A significant part of it is in the take up of energy efficiency opportunities. So the challenge originated, the challenge is now the developing world. Uh, and how we can transfer what is necessary is, is not only to encourage the uptake of the technologies uh, and the adoption of the best policies in the developing world, but for that it requires capital, it requires technology transfer, uh, and uh, we still haven't found the tools to really make that work effectively. So the sad thing, Neil, is that um, if the seawater rises in New York City, the good folk of New York City, it's actually not going to be as a result of what's occurring in the United States. It's going to be a result of what's occurring in the developing world. But on the other hand, what's occurring in the developing world, as I said, is lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, so it's a bit rough to criticise them for that. Yeah, just very quickly. I. Um uh, I would note there's no one from the U.S. government at the, on the uh, as we understand it, a new U.S.-Asia comprehensive energy partnership. That's something that we um, need to understand better and uh, and learn about from the U.S. government. Uh, as a general principle, dialogue is always a good thing. Business is always going to take the view that uh, a conducive operating environment is is what it will want out of any any dialogue. Uh, but certainly, you know, uh, uh, this should be. Uh, uh, an issue for open discussion, and this is why we very much support this kind of forum. Well, uh, thank you very much for your attention. This certainly has been a very informative and, and, and stimulating uh, this discussion. I don't want to hold you back from lunch too much longer, so please join me in thanking the panel.